Hello, this is the Food Institute podcast series. Uh, For over 90 years, the Food Institute has strived to be the best single source of current, timely, and relevant information about the food and beverage industry. My name is Brian Choi. I'm managing partner and CEO. And today we have a special guest, Deborah Bakker. Uh, She is president and co-founder of Blueberry Business Group. Uh, Deborah's lifelong industry career includes executive roles with domestic and global food manufacturers, consulting since 2000 at the CEO and board levels. She facilitates development and investment grade value creation strategies for blue chip and upper middle market food and beverage companies. Brian, welcome, thank you. It's Deborah. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, Deborah, you know, for the sake of our audience, um, maybe you could share a little bit more about your background and and what you do. And uh, um, and you know just to, to help set the stage of um, of our conversation today. Sure thing. Uh, well, your bio uh, sounded uh, very nice in terms of, of what it is that we do. Basically, Brian, we've been we are exclusively focused on the on the food industry as Blueberry Business Group, which I founded in two thousand. So we work at the CEO and board levels, which gives us a unique perspective uh, when talking with and working with food manufacturers. Uh, beverage manufacturers, uh, supermarket chain executives, distributor executives. We gather a lot of input from a lot of different areas to work with our clients and help them to create new value, uh, investor-grade value creation strategies, as you mentioned, for their organizations, which, as this morning's news told you, is probably more important now than it's been in a very long time. So thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Yeah, and that's and that's great, and and so um, you know w- I'd like to start the conversation um, about where we are today, and and uh, perhaps reference uh, where we've come from since the the crisis in in two thousand and eight and two thousand nine. Um, you know, obviously in February we saw great numbers. You know, GD, GDP was was you know uh, closer to the three percent. Um, uh, non-farm payrolls were up. You know, two hundred over two hundred seventy thousand, um, and then all of a sudden, it, it seems as though the U.S. economy had a heart attack, and and so, um, you know, were you surprised about what what happened, um, and how quickly um, we've experienced um, this contraction, not just economically but also um, financially. I certainly was. I mean, if you look back at prior economic troubles that this uh, particular uh, country has had, and even globally, you see that it's been a period of time, a bubble, so to speak, before there has been uh, a collapse. Um, You look at the Great Depression, the Great Recession, any recessions, even minor ones over the past decade or so, and it takes a period of time for these to build and then to ultimately uh, break, pop. Not this one. This one occurred so rapidly over the course of three weeks where we went from, as you mentioned, Brian, a pretty healthy economy to one that has just bottomed out, perhaps, or at least still heading downward towards a bottom. And that is unprecedented. So we're hearing terms and phrases. You pull up the Wall Street Journal, as I know you have, and we're seeing words that just hit us one after another. Crisis, panic, a great recession, great depression, unemployment, all of these numbers, all of these phrases hitting us at the same time. We haven't had a period of time to get used to it. It isn't something that, uh, that, that, we saw building over time. It's kind of a thief in the night. All of a sudden, there it is. You didn't expect it, and wow, what an impact! How about how about you? Do you do you feel that as well? Do you see that? Uh, absolutely. Um, it, I don't think anyone could have predicted um, that it would be so uh, dramatic um, as it relates to to um, the stoppage of the economy. Um, however, I will say that. Um, Know, being in the financial industry for for many years, um, and having gone through the longest bull market in history, um, I'm not surprised in terms of the, um, um, the 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 drastic cuts that we've seen 
in in GDP growth, um, in unemployment, you know, even unemployment claims, because, you know, since 2008, I've always had the the perspective that um, the Federal Reserve has intervened in the economy and in in the markets like they've never done historically. It's really unprecedented what what they've been doing, um, and I. I I recognize that um, the, uh, the the monetary policy for 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 the U.S. economy to to stave off a, a longer recession. I understand the reasonings why they had to pump 800 billion dollars in the uh, in the financial systems in 2008 and 2009. Um, and and but what I what I have been really surprised is is that since 2008 2009 they've continued to um, to intervene in the markets and um, right up until um, I want to say even February we've seen volatility um, in the markets to, to such a low degree that it, it it's it's a natural and I've always had the thinking even you know Three four years uh, ago, in the back of my mind, I, I I was thinking this is not normal. This it's it's unnatural to have the central banks, not just the U.S. but even talking globally, even G7 nations, intervene to the level that they've 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 had. And I've um and I've had the thought that eventually it's going to come back. And and guess what? I think this this the the dramatic fall that we've seen in the markets and the GDP, I, I think it's a, a result of the tremendous monetary policy intervention that we've, uh, you know, we've seen over the past 10 years. And isn't it interesting, Brian, to your point, you know, back in 2009, 2010, I, I was chairman of a top to top conference. It was a closed session of just food industry CEOs coming together, invitation only, uh, and and that was the, we were talking about the lagging effects. There were about 200 CEOs there from all areas of the industry. And we were talking about the lagging effects on their business. This was at a time when a lot of companies had invested in uh, manufacturing ramp up, for example, um, the restaurant units were thinking about doing remodels in order to create a better patron experience. Supermarkets were still, you know, perhaps um, unsure of their direction at the time. And there really wasn't a lot of monetary policy that the leaders in that room could count on. And then, of course, there came the debate of, you know, does Wall Street bail out the, the banks or do they bail out, you know, the consumer? And you know, do you see from your perspective that this particular stimulus monetary easing, $2 trillion, which we both know isn't going to last very long uh, against the figures that came out this morning in the GDP projections. But do you, do you see that, um, that there is a different approach to stimulus packages this time around than there was back in 2008, 2009? The difference is, um, you know, I think in 2008, 2009, it, it took a while for them to put this package together. Um, and um, what was very surprising to me is just the speed in which um, Jerome Powell and his team have, have um, intervened just proactively. Like, um, for them to start intervening in the CP markets, in the repo markets, um, this was starting like even back in September of last year. Um, they were intervening in the markets, and so um, the the speed in which they've acted, and and in addition to that, the the magnitude. So we're going from 800, 800 billion to six trillion dollars. That's a fact. That's a factor of like six, six, seven times, um, and it's it's really shocking. It's it's really shocking, and I, I, I don't, I don't believe that it's gonna. It's it's a uh, a long term solution. I think it's it's just a shot in a shot in the arm, uh, make people feel happy that they're getting a paycheck, 
and mind you, a one-time paycheck. <laughs> um, and then after that, what's going to happen, right? The, it's almost as if the, gov- the, the, the government and the Federal, federal Reserve, they've created a, a false sense of security telling the businesses and also individuals, hey, don't worry, we got your back. We're going to continue to add stimulus, right? And, um, and we just read uh, yesterday in the news uh, of another tr- tr- $2 trillion infrastructure plan that the, that the government is pursuing, right? And so it becomes a dependence on the government that, um, and that's what's scary, right? At the end of the day, you can print as much money as you, as you want, right? But that doesn't create long-term growth. And that's what's happened. It's, it's the past 10 years, we've seen an over-reliance upon, upon the Federal Reserve. Um, and now we're, we're becoming more dependent on, uh, on the government. On the on, on more and more stimulus, you've got such a great perspective, and you know, for for your listeners, I think it's important for them to hear your perspective. We've used a term, and I haven't talked to you about this yet, but I was intending to, and that is uh, what we call industry financialization. And when I talk about industry, I'm talking about the food industry in particular, for the sake of your listeners. Industry financialization, which is a growing influence of the financial markets and financial institutions uh, on the industry. And we're seeing private equity becoming more involved in the food industry than ever before. And of course, the valuations are driving up, and and now you know the private sector is competing with the um, the public sector with identifying acquisition targets, uh, private equity's influence, uh, particularly on restaurants. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, as far as how you see that playing out? What is the impact of the events over the past month on the private equity sector, and specifically? I realize this is a tough question, but specifically what that could mean for private equity in food service and in even the broader food manufacturing industry. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think first, first of all, I think um, um, as we enter into this, into this recession, and I would even, I would even go so far to say potentially even a depression. Um, um, I, 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 my expectation, you'll see a lot of capital um, not be deployed. I think you'll you'll see a lot of investors pull their money from private equity firms, um, and um, I, I believe we'll see closures of a lot of private equity. Um, and so, and you know, quite frankly, I think on the whole, I think that that'll be a good thing. Because having, you know, in my prior role as um, working for a, a family investment office where we made private equity investments buying controlling positions in food companies, um, what we've noticed is um, the, um, the amount of deals where private equity, um, they would acquire food, food companies and absolutely destroy them because they don't understand the fundamentals of the food industry. They're, they're applying um, the same models, the same theories that they used in other industries and say, hey, we can, we can go ahead and, and do the same thing in the food industry. And we've seen um, the devastation of, of, uh, of, of investor capital as a result of that. Case in point, Campbell's, Campbell's right? So they, they were on an acquisition spree, right? And, and a lot of a lot of their um, business business leaders, they come from you know the the business you know the top business schools, right? They're being advised by investment bankers, right? Um, they started to acquire um, Garden Fresh Salsa was one business that they acquired. They they acquired Bolt House Farms, right? And what happened? Over, over two over two to three years, they've absolutely destroyed those two businesses and ultimately had to divest because shareholders were were wondering why 
um, margins are, are, are decreasing, why growth rates are decreasing. And, um, and what ended up happening, they, they, they overpaid. They overpaid. Um, and that's on the strategic side. There are many examples of other private equity firms that have come in to acquire these food businesses, and they're overpaying. And at the end of the day, they're, they're having to divest them at, uh, at losses, and in some cases, substantial losses. Another example, J&J &J, &J, um, uh, Produce Company. It was bought up by a private equity firm, um, I want to say maybe five years ago. Um, they didn't know anything about farming. Uh, they don't. They didn't know how to operate a produce-related business, and um, and unfortunately, the the business the business had to be sold. And I think, I think at a substantial um, lower valuation than than what they acquired. Well, we saw the huge Kraft Heinz write-off last year, which made headlines, and I think that's going to become more commonplace. But to your point, Brian, it's interesting about the private equity's influence on the food industry is that there are so many variables in the food industry that are not present This is uh, in other industries. If you could visually map the routes and channels between uh, very upstream in the supply area and, and manufacturers, of course, you know, buying ingredients and all sorts of things to make their goods, and then you visualize the route and channels through which those products migrate and move through the system ultimately to either a supermarket shelf or an operator menu, it's incredible how much value is trapped between food manufacturers, food and beverage manufacturers, and the shelf or the operator menu. And that's a big wake-up call to private equity or, or those that are new or returning to the industry over a period of time is that we've gone from a somewhat closed system where manufacturers would you know generally uh, route and negotiate um, the purchase of their goods by a, by a retailer or a food service restaurant chain to now all of these routes and channels and gates and GPOs and wholesalers and 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 brokers and so forth and that I think you would agree, is the big shock that private equity or any newcomer to the food industry sees about our industry. And that also made it incredibly vulnerable to what we've seen over the past three to four weeks. It, it's an unsustainable condition of anywhere from 25 to 30 percent of gross price value that is trapped and actually made it extremely difficult and very shaky foundation. The economics of the food industry on its on their on itself is extremely uh, 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 shaky. Uh, you just can't sustain that type of financial or economic model over time. And if you do, all of a sudden you turn around and we've got a pandemic that takes what had been uh, very questionable and in need of change and collapses an entire industry and even more so the broader economy almost overnight right and the other aspect that I, I think private equity has brought into the food industry is the over leverage right so they would they would put on so much debt um, and um, really leave no room for error <laughs> for you know for the, for food industry execs that are that are trying to and so, so what happens when when there is a coronavirus, right? It absolutely it 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 shuts these companies down to a level where they have so much debt on on their books that they can't they can't navigate um, uh, a rebound. So let me ask you this, Brian. Based on that, I mean, the unemployment numbers that we saw today, and combined with last week, which is over ten million. I mean, are these could you just guess as to whether or not some of the um, some of these numbers are preemptive measures by the food industry or the greater economy to conserve cash? I mean, are these? Yes. Is this preventative? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I I, I think a lot. Um, if I were to guess, I, I would think that its majority is preventative. Okay. Um, and there's definitely a, a portion where they they just they just have to right because they, they um, and especially if you're a restaurant chain and and 
you know, the government tells you to shut down for 30 days, you, you know, <laughs> you know, you, you have no choice. But, um, you know, you bring up a, a point. It's about liquidity. And and that's that's what the especially on the restaurant chain, that's what they need. Right. Um, you'll it's 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 a rush into cash right now. So whoever has the biggest cash pile to weather the next, you know, I'll, and I'll make it short term here, the next three, three months, right. And maybe six months. Um, if, if they have that, that cash flow available, whether it's from, you know, from a credit line or just cash on the books, that's, that's the, that's the key. So we know this is very interesting what you're saying because I'm actually creating a picture in my mind what you're saying. So on one hand, you have some of the unemployment number attributable to a preemptive measure to conserve cash. The second move would be when companies are drawing down their loan facilities, right? And then a third, more specific to CPG or the food industry, is what to do with the inventory because we know that inventory in warehouses um, – over a period of time, costs food companies more than probably anything else in the world, you know, that movement of inventory. So from your point of view, you're seeing these multiple approaches to do everything that they can to address their cash position so that they are not only kept alive, but they're able to perhaps use something to build upon when things stabilize. Right, exactly, right. So every... Uh, I. You know, most food companies, it's it's about survival now, yep. right? And um, and so we we've seen, you know, like you mentioned, you mentioned Kraft, right? You know, we saw right. U.S. Foods draw down on their on their credit facilities. You saw Darden yes. Darden restaurants do the same. Oh, I saw that. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is going to continue. Um, mm-hmm. You've had companies like Cheesecake Factory tell their landlords, We're, "We are not going to pay rent." That's right. <laughs> Right, mm-hmm. starting you know as, uh, as of yesterday, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's 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 about you know talk about Darwinianism, Darwinism, right? Like survival of the fittest. It's, it's all about survival right now. I think to to your point, um, we learned something here from t- two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and that is that the economy doesn't want to be awash with a bunch of real estate and they don't want to have a bunch of defaults. They don't want to have homes that they're, that the banks are stuck, stuck with and, and they have to try to sell. They, the, the restaurant industry in particular had done things with real estate that made it more um, uh, feasible for them to continue with the lease back programs back then. Um, and I think, you know, now, those, in hindsight, those were good measures when it comes to the leaseback programs with restaurants or even grocery stores. And I think, though, that it's now taken another um, step further, which is, uh, you know, we, we can't pay you the lease. We, we, we just can't and we won't. So it's a question of what is the worst of the two alternatives? Do you force, <laughs> you know, your, your leasee, if you are a real estate company, to pay their their lease or their their mortgage or do you cut them a, a break for the greater good of the economy and um, and let it pass for a couple of months with some agreed terms for payback in the future those are the types of decisions that are brand new to the business world and the economy don't don't you think Brian we've never had to have those decisions before we've never had to make them we are now absolutely absolutely and I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the whole stimulus um, plays out. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know how much uh, flexibility the government will give these landlords. Um, um, but I think what's going to happen is, you know, I, I saw one article that um, uh, where you know the author was predicting maybe twenty to thirty percent cut in uh, in the average uh, rental um, lease, and I and I think that's reasonable. I think. You know what's what's the, the 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 rational thing to do is for landlords to work with, um, you know, to to work with the you know the um, the the leases to to figure out what's 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 manageable in the near term, right? And kind of worry about okay, how how are the landlords going to get paid back down the road? Um, and you know, if you're a landlord, you know, I 
yeah, it's 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 not it, it's not advisable to to uh, to be too strict. I think at the, at this point, uh, but just to just to help the the situation, at least for the for the near term, to to, to provide some flexibility. What you're outlining here is a perfect example of we always you know we want to predict the future. We want to predict how this is going to end. As people, we do that. As executives, we love to do that because then we can modify. But all we can do, um, to your point right now, I believe all the industry can do, the industry leaders can do specific to food, is plan and prepare for the effects of what's happening today. We can't look too down the road because we just don't know. Maybe we can create four to five different scenarios and, you know, perhaps do some uh, war games in terms of how we would approach those particular outcomes as yet unknown. But what all we can do, and I think all the industry is doing right now, is managing the effects. Very difficult to be able to predict what that new normal will look like, but we can only take the temperature of today. Don't, don't you think, Brian, and make those adjustments for the short term to just get us all through this as best we can? Absolutely, I hundred percent agree, and um, and I'd love to, you know I'd love to kind of hear what you know the types of conversations that you're having right as an advisor yeah. to 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 the CEOs and the boards of you know these large companies. Um, what are you telling them? You know what um, is it is it to to um, just focus on liquidity or I'm 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 just curious to 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 hear your perspective. Well, they've got excellent CFOs. I mean, our, the CFOs in our industry, for the most part, are, are tremendous. I mean, um, so the CEO is working more closely with the, the CFO than ever before to, to manage those particular issues related to cash. Um, and the reminders are beneficial. The conversations that we've had this week with very large companies, public as well as um, very large private companies, because they're just, you know, it doesn't really make any difference whether you're public or private, the effects are the same, is that they've said, they're saying right now, these CEOs are saying, okay, we had to do what we did over the past three to four weeks, which was ensure our employees are safe and protected and we had to answer some very unusual demands from our customers. And they did a very good job with that. There's no question. They're stepping outside of not only their comfort zone, but they're, they got their backs up against the wall. It's just incredible to hear what they've been having to do. But what we're hearing now in the conversations that are very good is that they are restoring their organization's original purpose and vision, which is what are we here to do and has that North Star changed? And the answer to that is no. And that becomes a very much of a grounding feature for their employees. It becomes reliable for their customers. They know that these big food companies are there to do what they have pur purpose to do ever since they were, you know, came into being. Um, and so now they're starting to talk about what are the scenarios? What are the effects? And their scenario, we, we're actually talking to them and, and doing some excellent conversation facilitation along, is this going to be um, a, a midterm series of effects on the market, the economy, the macro economy, and the industry, or is it going to be longer? So it's no longer short or long, it's mid or long. And then the depth of the effects, is it severe or is it very severe? And out of that, you've got four different scenarios that you factor in, everything from monetary easing to consumer sentiment and psychology um, to the effects of debt on the consumer. And it's all sorts of, of variables that you can play with within those four boxes that come out of a two-by-two two matrix. What's very interesting, though, Brian, is that CEOs are now coming face-to-face -face bravely uh, and with a clear-eyed view on a fifth dimension that we call the unthinkable. Those things that we never imagined would ever hit our industry. The business conditions we never imagined would take place. We never thought that the unemployment numbers would reach 6.5 million in a week. That's unthinkable. If we mentioned that two months ago, everybody would have laughed and said, that's ridiculous. We never thought about the effects of the possibility of 240,000 people dying and what the effect that will have on, on consumer psychology. So those unthinkable types of conversations 
are taking place bravely and with clear headedness and a sense of calm to go ahead and chart the way forward. And these CEOs, boards, are coming to terms with the fact that it's very possible they have to learn how to take a very large company and perhaps learn how to be a very successful mid-sized company. And I don't say that with pleasure. I say that with reality, and they know that. A big chunk of their business, 50 55%, just dropped off over the past you know, 30 days. So a lot of courage, a lot of resolve, a lot of refocus of their top teams and even their board members to focus on those possible scenarios, possible contingencies, and then that fifth element is we really need to start thinking about the unthinkable and, and the what ifs. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's as slow as we go and it's steady as we go as best as we can and just man, manage the effects and, and hold on for the next you know, headline that tells us where this whole crisis is going. And I think that's the best they can do. And you know, they're doing an excellent job, just excellent. Right. And the, the, one, the one bright piece of news that I, that I saw yesterday um, is, is a, um, a Washington University study you know, projecting when things will peak as it relates to the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're, they're projecting maybe in, in two to three weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And so obviously there, you know, the, um, there's a lot of uncertainty with these projections, but, um, you know, that's, that was one uh, ray of hope, right? So once things peak, hopefully a few weeks after that, there, you know, um, there'll be, there'll be a decline and eventually maybe, maybe it's in May, maybe it's in June, possibly July of, um, you know, the U.S. being able to reopen the economy. Um, And so, you know, I that definitely would be wonderful news, wouldn't it? So we can all be <laughs> optimistic <laughs> and safe. Oh my goodness, uh, the safety factor is. Yeah, uh, you know, we're seeing the humanity of these CEOs come out. How much, how deeply they care for their people. It's not all dollars and cents to them. Yes, it's an important factor because it contributes to the wellness of their people and their customers. But we're seeing this. Uh, we've moved from bewilderment to a period of despair to now tremendous hope and conviction that they're going to make sure as best as they can that people will be safe. There's no joy in these uh, in these unemployment numbers by our industry CEOs, none at all, and no coldness. Um, they are genuinely concerned and trying to do the best they can and, uh, and again, just learning as they're going and making the, decision, the, the decisions that they have to make. Right, right, and we'll, we'll, you and I will be we rooting will. them on, and uh, we certainly will, <laughs> and doing what yep. we do best, you know, um, providing the advice and news that we, uh, that we can help them educate them and and to get them through this. Uh, this yeah, summer. information so, is very important to them, um, and, and what you've shared today is 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 outstanding in terms of the broader picture. Uh, it's important to keep note because that broader picture does translate into more of a. Uh, of an independent level, you know, the economics of running a country um, and keeping a country moving is really not that different from the economics of keeping an industry going and even deeper than that, keeping an organization going. Uh, Some of the principles are exactly the same. Right, right. Well, this is, uh, this has been great. Um, You know, we're coming up to the, uh, we're just past 30 minutes now, but um, um, but I'm looking forward to, to the next conversation with you, Deborah. And, um, you know, thank you so much for providing your, your thoughts and expertise in this matter. And, um, um, you know, uh, appreciate, appreciate all the, the help and support you've given uh, me. And well, the it's Institute. been my pleasure. And thank you so much for your contribution as well to a very important discussion. It's been interesting. It's been invigorating. And uh, we'll, we will keep doing our best to continue you know, to inform the industry and, and do our part to help them along as the Food Institute is certainly doing as well. So thank you for your contribution. All right. Thank you. 